Okay, let's talk about biblical interpretation. This is our list of topics, and you'll begin as we go along, I think, to see the parallel reference between the sort of thing I've got here and what you're going to be reading in the book. Because there is very much a sense that we, um, you know, today we'll do a general introduction. I'll be giving you some terminology. I'll talk a little bit about the history of biblical interpretation because there have been very distinct periods of how Christians have done biblical interpretation. <laughs> Um, next week we'll be starting with the text, because that's where you start in interpretation. You start with the text, and the first section of the book that you'll be reading is about the text, and how we got that text, and whether it's reliable, and what inerrancy means, and I'll be talking about some of those things next week. <coughs> then the third week, the <coughs> questions of meaning. Once you actually have the text, and you're reading the text, the question is, what does it mean? How do I determine the meaning here? And we'll talk a little bit about that, each of these things today, just touching on them. Then, two weeks on the principles of interpretation. Again, there are certain kinds of rules that we need to follow in order to both be more accurate um, and more appropriate to the Scripture being the Word of God. So we'll talk about that for two weeks, and then we'll focus for two weeks on first interpreting the New Testament and then the Old Testament. And it may seem odd to put it in that order, the New Testament is our primary document, obviously, for Christianity. Um, and so we start with the focus on that. But we also need to recognize the Old Testament. We believe the Old Testament is has value in itself as the message of God to his people, the Israelites. But we also see it as being fundamental to a most accurate understanding of the New Testament. I'm going to actually look at a passage later today, and we'll talk about a little bit about what that means. Um, let me open with prayer. I forgot to do that. So, Father God, we are so grateful that you have given us your blessings and especially that you have spoken to us in your word. We pray that you would bless us and direct us as we seek to know more and to do better in, in interpreting and understanding your word to us in scripture. So guide and teach us, we pray, as we do it to the honor and glory of Jesus and in his name. Amen. Okay. Um, <coughs> This process of biblical interpretation, we have a mandate from Scripture to do these things. I'm going to give you four verses here. The first one, Psalm 119.18. Open my eyes that, that I may see wonderful things in your law. The idea of looking at, in the Old Testament case, the law, um, and saying, God, help me understand this. Help me interpret this. Help me find meaning in this. We then have 2 Timothy, a description of Scripture, when Paul talks to Timothy and saying, From infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. There you have the purpose of Scripture. To make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Then 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That, that verse particularly speaks to the dual authorship of Scripture. And that is that it is by the will of God, and that it is God-breathed, as we saw in the Second Timothy pa uh, passage, but that there, there is a writer, a human writer involved. Because it says prophecy never had its origin in the human will, the people didn't initiate this. They're not writing what they think. But the prophets, though human, there's a recognition in that passage that these are human beings. We're going to talk a little bit later about the, the next week we'll talk about the various theories of inspiration. How is it that God inspired people to write these books? Um, today I will mention a definition of what is usually accepted as the biblical, the, the accurate biblical version, which is, is the, the idea of plenary. A verbal plenary inspiration. This miraculous thing that God willed the writing of Scripture, but He did so through people. And He dealt with those people as free, individual, and different. The style of writing from John, for instance, is completely different than the style of writing from, from Paul. So God didn't sort of overwhelm these writers and turn them into robots so that they all are exactly the same in how they express things. He let the human writers of Scripture um, show through their style, their personality, but at the same time, he mysteriously and miraculously made sure that they were guided, superintended is the word that's often used, so that the words that were written were exactly what God intended. 
This is verbal plenary <coughs> inspiration. And we'll get into some of the different ideas about that later on. But perhaps the, the scripture that is most our mandate for this class is from 2 Timothy 2, 15 and 16, where we're told, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now, it's true that there are professional Christians. There are people whom God has called to be in professional positions of leadership as pastors and teachers, missionaries, uh, various kinds of ministers. And they have a special responsibility to, to, you know, to study this stuff. I've, I spent years in school to do this. That doesn't mean all of you have the same responsibility, but we all do have the responsibility to take this seriously to the, to the extent that we achieve a level of ability to correctly handle the word of truth. It's the, it's the people who do not correctly handle the word of truth that are the source of so many of the heresies and problems in the world today. And all of us as Christians have a responsibility to develop some level of competence in this regard. And that's why these classes, okay? Any questions about that? Yes, Bob. Going back to the second Peter quotation. Okay. Would that verse apply to all of Scripture or just to the book of the, the books of the prophets? I think it means all of Scripture because when it says prophecy, prophecy isn't just the writings of the Old Testament prophets, and it's not just prophecy doesn't mean telling the future, although it may be that a prophetic utterance is about something yet to come. Um, to prophesy means to speak the word of God. A prophet is one who speaks the word of God for the people. And so whenever we talk about prophets or prophecy, we have to be careful we don't limit that to an Old Testament definition or to a, a future-telling definition. Prophecy means to speak the word of God to the people. And so when it says, for prophets, uh, prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, that's all of the writers of Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, those who were speaking the word of God. Uh, the humans spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Anything else? Any other questions about that? <coughs> Alright, let's look at some terms as a way of introducing ourselves to biblical interpretation. The first word we need to understand we need to know is exegesis. It is from the Greek word exegesis. <laughs> That's why we got exegesis, which means to lead out or to come out from. Uh, exit. Exodus, exegesis means to come out. In other words, to lead out or to draw out from the text the meaning. A definition will be a critical explanation or interpretation of a text, particularly a religious text. Now, you can do exegesis of any spoken or written word, especially written. Um, traditionally used primarily for exegesis of the Bible, however, in modern usage, biblical exegesis distinguishes it from other broader critical text explanations. In other words, they used to say exegesis and everybody assumed you meant the Bible. But now they talk about exegesis of other kinds of literature. And so we talk about biblical exegesis in order to be more clear about that. Now, the word exegesis is important because it means we go to the text and we draw out from that text what it says and means. As opposed to eisegesis, which is another Greek word. Eisegesis means to put into not to take out from, but to put into. Too many preachers and teachers and Christians are guilty of committing eisegesis, which means they take their own prejudices, their own preconceptions, their own, their own predeterminations about what they want the Scripture to mean, and they put it into the Scripture, eisegesis. And then they preach it as though it were God's truth. This is why Christianity, this is how Scripture has been used in so many ways over the millennia, 2,000 years, especially since the New Testament, to try to prove falsehood, to try to prove false religious beliefs or, or social prejudices or anything else. It's been used to defend racism and you name it, sexism. Uh, that is when we take our prejudices and preconceptions and we put it into Scripture, eisegesis. That's not the right way to do it. We are doing exegesis, taking the text and seeing what God would have us take out of it, learn from it, the meaning and application. Understand? So it's important to understand those differences. A second word we need to know is hermeneutics. This is the theory of textual interpretation, especially the interpretation of biblical texts, wisdom literature, and philosophy texts. There was a time, again, like exegesis, when hermeneutics, for most people, uh, in scholarly people, meant entirely um, interpretation of Scripture, of the Bible. 
But hermeneutics, there's now a hermeneutics of science. There's a hermeneutics of sociology. Hermeneutics can be applied to anything since it means to basically interpret, to draw meaning from, a written text. Um, but it's, it's, hermeneutics is the larger of the two. In fact, hermeneutics and exegesis are sometimes used interchangeably. Books on exegesis, you know, biblical exegesis, books on biblical hermeneutics can be exactly the same thing. <clears throat> because they use those terms interchangeably. But in fact, hermeneutics is the larger word. It's the, the wider discipline. It includes written, verbal, and nonverbal communication. You can do a hermeneutical analysis of somebody's speech or sermon, even if you don't have the written text. Um, exegesis is almost always used with reference to written text, not to spoken word or anything else. Okay? Now, I, in this class, will usually talk about biblical interpretation. And I'll get to that definition in a second. If I don't say biblical interpretation, I will probably use the word hermeneutics because it's the larger word. But don't get confused. Exegesis, hermeneutics. Generally speaking, they come to mean pretty much the same thing. Um, any questions about that? You might be interested to know that the hermeneutics, um, the both are Greek words, but hermeneutics, the folk etymology, etymology means the source of, it's where words come from. The folk etymology of the word hermeneutics goes back to the Greek god Hermes, who was the messenger of the gods. And that's where the Greek developed this word, hermeneutics, is from the name Hermes. He was seen, uh, Hermes was seen as the mediator between the gods and between gods and men. He's also one that leads souls uh, to the underworld after death. But the interesting thing is that, and, and this is a cautionary tale for us, Hermes was considered not only the inventor of language and speech, but also that he was a liar, a trickster, a thief. <laughs> and the whole point was that Hermes seemed, took great joy in the, the Greek legends in presenting messages to humans which were ambiguous and then taking great fun out of the fact that they might get it wrong or have problems with it. So hermeneutics, almost from its the beginning of its uh, title of the word, has to be used carefully because it can lead you in the wrong direction, as Hermes often did, as much as it can lead you in the right direction. And that's why there is the discipline of, of appropriate hermeneutics and interpretation. Okay? Yes? Is there a certain theory of textual interpretation? Is there a certain methodology or a certain way of interpreting text? In, uh, in this textual interpretation, is there a certain methodology? That's what this class is. Okay. This class is to study uh, the accepted Christian, especially the evangelical Orthodox Christian approach to it. Now again, there are different methodologies that occur. When you talk about a hermeneutics of sociology, they have a very different kind of process. But um, what we will deal with as we go through this course is exactly that. And in particular, I'm going to I'm going to approach that that um, the process, the hermeneutical process, in terms of question and answer which is the way I think we can most readily get our, get our claws into it in terms of how, understanding how to do this. But there is a methodology, and when we talk about scriptural hermeneutics, especially evangelical scriptural hermeneutics, that's what this course is about. <coughs> okay? Um, again, our class is about biblical interpretation. Here is a very convoluted definition of biblical interpretation, because I wanted to get everything in here. And these, uh, most of these definitions are mine. Uh, I may have started with something else, but then I adapt them. Um, Biblical interpretation is the process of finding the purpose, meaning, and right application of a passage of scripture through the study of the cultural, geographic, and historical context of the original writers and audiences, through literary genre and forms, textual sources and variants, language structure, word meaning and grammar, and theological harmony within scripture. That's the whole package. But what we're going to be doing over the next eight weeks is unwrapping each piece of that <coughs> so that we understand how we get to the meaning. The reason I loaded all that into one definition is because the various pieces, you know, the, the cultural, geographic, and historical context of the writers, the literary genre and forms, the textual sources and variants, language structure, word meaning, and grammar, and theological harmony are all different aspects of this methodology. Okay? Now, um, this is a formal discipline. Again, we're going to deal with it in fairly informal terms, but this is what scholars do Except scholars who do this kind of biblical interpretation, when they talk about text and textual variants, they'll deal with the original languages and with the ancient source documents. We're not going to dig in that deep because we're here for eight weeks, 16 hours. 
but um, we will talk about what the issues are related to some of that so that you can understand. Um, for the most part, we, this approach is not a formal academic approach so much as it is a lay understanding of that approach, that methodology. Okay? Um, a great quote from Robert L. Palmer, who has written a book. Um, he's written a couple of books on, on uh, interpretation. One of them I would recommend to you that I'll be using a lot in creating my lectures is called 40 Questions of Biblical Interpretation. Um, Plummer says, to interpret a document is to express its meaning through speaking or writing. We either talk about what it means or we write what it means. To engage in interpretation assumes that there is, in fact, a proper and improper meaning of the text, and that care must be taken not to misrepresent the meaning. This methodology is intended to have us get it right, as opposed to getting it wrong, which is possible. When dealing with the scriptures, to properly interpret a text is to faithfully convey the inspired human author's meaning of the text while not neglecting divine intent. Again, we get into the dual authorship here. It is both God and it is humans. We can't divorce it from either one. And so good biblical interpretation takes both of those things into account. Um, and let me talk about that dual authorship for a minute. This is, this is again, this is my statement. This is a description of uh, verbal plenary inspiration, which is, is widely accepted as being the accurate understanding of how God inspired scriptures. We hold the Bible to be of dual authorship, a miraculous process whereby God worked through thinking, feeling individuals, mysteriously superintending the process to have written exactly what he wants, which is the definition of verbal plenary inspiration. For that reason, it makes good sense for biblical interpretation to start with the clear intent and purpose of the human author, since scriptures cannot mean less than what the human author's intended. You get that? In other words, when Paul wrote the, first, the letter to the first Corinthians, he had a particular intention. There were problems that were arisen. He knew the people he was writing to. He knew what their circumstance was. He knew um, what needed to be done to help them resolve the problem. And so he wrote to them, and in doing so, he wrote to them in a way that was appropriate to the people on the other end who was going to get it, who were going to get it, what they were doing, what their problems were, who they were, what their inclinations were, what their strengths and weaknesses were, all of that. And yet he did so by the mysterious motivation and inspiration of God. And so we need to understand, in order to accurately understand and interpret that scripture, we need to first, we can start with, where was Paul coming from? What were all the details behind this? Because that at least is what is evident or should be evident in the scripture for us, in addition to God's intention. You know, because Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians or the Ephesians or the Thessalonians or whatever, and in it he, he addressed specific concerns and problems and questions that those different groups of people had, why has this come down to us 2,000 years later? Because it also applies to us. Because God's message was not only for the Thessalonians in those two letters, but it's for us. And so, but first, let's figure out what it was for the Thessalonians, and that is the best way for us to then figure out what of this does God intend for us to apply to our own lives. Fair? And so in the process, as I told you, and I'm going to give you a couple of different versions of this question and answer question thing today, um, we can start with questions like this. What did this text, whichever text we're studying, mean to the original writers and the audiences? What was Paul intending? What was the issue with the Corinthians, for instance, in the, in the letters to the Corinthians? Second, what are differences between the biblical audiences and us? How are we different than them? We don't have a real problem with, you know, um, formalized emperor worship by the, you know, by the Roman authorities, for instance. That's not a problem we address, and so we need to recognize that. And by the way, you can feel free to take notes on this stuff, but all of this, this PowerPoint, will also be on the website. When you go on and you look for biblical interpretation, there will be the video, and the video is really obvious because it shows the, an image from the video of me sitting up here. Um, and then it also has all of the, it's had, we do it both in, Carolyn does it both in PowerPoint and in PDF. So if you don't have PowerPoint, because you don't have Microsoft Office, virtually any computer that turns on anymore, you can, you can open a PDF file. So that's all, this is all there in case you want to go back and review this. Yes? I was just uh, pondering here. Um, it seems like there's, a, there's many things as you read the Bible. Some people say, well, that was said because of the time that it was written in. But some of those things that were written at the time are still true today. And some of them 
you can say, well, that's because of the time it was written. Right. So we have a choice, mm -hmm. it looks like, on which way we go. For example, you know, short hair was sinful. Well, back then, short hair was you know, okay. good thing. And big ball was preferred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we get ourselves in trouble in a way. I mean, we're, we're set to make a judgment as to what is what passes through and what stays there. Right. Which is exactly why we're doing this course. Okay. That's what it means to rightly yeah. you know, work with the yeah. Word of God yeah. from the Timothy passage. That would seem to be a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, and again, when we, read, when we read where Paul is talking about, or, or other writers, um, when they're making reference, clearly making reference to emperor worship, that you know, Christians were persecuted because they refused to pay homage, you know, to burn incense and to to uh, make declaration that the emperor was divine, was God. Well, we don't have that problem. And so we can't interpret, we can't read that literally as something that applies to us today. But then the methodology is we then have to say, but is there something, some meaning behind that that applies to us today, that God desires for us? For instance, is there something else that, that is existing in the world today that we may be worshiping, that we may be treating as though we're divine. It may not be the emperor, but is it our car? Is it our political party? Is it our, you know, our significant other, our children? So the point is, exactly as you said, Rod, to go through and to read the text and first understand what it, what it literally means, the literal meaning. And then to say, well, what part of that doesn't literally apply to us today, but what is the deeper meaning behind it that God would have us draw out and understand that is for us today? Okay, and so that is exactly why we have a methodology of biblical interpretation and, and the process that we go through. Okay? Just, just one. Yes, um, Harry. Uh, I see a, in, in this whole, so maybe you can touch on this somewhere, uh, a difficulty in that uh, back then, uh, people didn't have words for many of, especially when it comes to prophecy, what might be. So prophecy to me didn't mean anything necessarily, or was was not clear to the people who were hearing it. But yet, uh, and even as time has unfolded, uh, starts to become clear now, but had no meaning back then. So the matter of prophecy. Well, when you say prophecy, define how what you mean by that word. Uh, to, to do with something coming in the future. Okay, a future, you know, a fourth day, a foretelling, you know. Um, well, they had a very clear, I'm not quite sure what you mean, they had a very clear understanding that there were prophetic statements. In fact, well, they were, but the meaning of the statements. Okay. Uh, like some, some of the things that, uh, uh, the beast, what did the beast mean? Okay. How do we interpret that? Okay. Um, it's true. Now, um, the book of Revelation, you know, one of the reasons that people struggle with the book of Revelation is because what does all that stuff mean? In fact, Revelation is one of the books that, that, they, the church really worked hard to figure out whether that ought to be in scripture or not because there's places it's just kind of weird, okay? And it's very hard to understand. Uh, but now, I'll talk about the history of biblical interpretation in a minute. Um, most of the first, at least two centuries of the church, biblical interpretation of them meant interpretation of prophecy, okay? That's what it meant, and by that, by prophecy, I mean previous telling as it's understood today. If you go into the, new, into the book of Acts and you read the first great sermon of Peter in the second chapter of Acts where 3,000 people converted or later sermons of Peter or the testimony of Stephen, you know, before he became the first martyr or, or some of the early sermons of Paul, all of them are explanations of how the ancient Jewish prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus. Well, that same model was carried on in the first two centuries of the Christian church. Much of what biblical interpretation meant was an interpretation of prophetic utterances to demonstrate that they're fulfilled. And so I, I, I'm not quite sure what you mean about they didn't well, understand prophecy. Okay, or the people uh, back prior to, the, in the first uh, Testament prophecy, okay. the prophets were making statements that the people at that time not, not, in the, right. not in the fulfillment, but the original ones would say, well, we, we say that, but we don't know how it's going to happen. Yeah. In fact, we get it wrong. Uh, right. We would interpret, you know, uh, Christ is coming, but he's going to have an army of armies, of, like we think of armies. Right. So the interpretation of prophetic prophecies to come 
uh, for the people at the time when they're uttered right. or, or stated. Well, that, that's that's, that's true. I mean, uh, in fact, almost all uh, prophetic utterances, prophetic meaning foretelling, telling something that hasn't happened yet, almost all of them need to be understood as being of two and two levels. In almost every case, now the exception of this probably would be some of the the prophecies about the coming Messiah, because they didn't understand, you know, why his stripes were your heel. You know, a lot of what Isaiah said, they would have gone, what are you talking about? But most of the ancient prophecies, they understood an application for now. They didn't see, you know, later on in New Testament times after Jesus, they were able to say, okay, we know how that applied to the people in, in Malachi's time. But now we understand that there's a second level of meaning which has been fulfilled now. All right? The same thing is true with much of the New Testament. I mean, we look at part of Revelation and we say, well, some of that was fulfilled in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed the temple. Some of the New Testament prophecies. But there's an expectation that much of that will not be fulfilled until later. Already, but not yet. And so, yes, there's two levels of that. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit as we go on. It's important to, to note, as I'll say in a minute, that during the or the apostolic and the um, the apostolic age and the immediate or sub-apostolic age after that, that the interpretation of prophecy to be understood in light of the coming Christ of the Christ who would have come um, is a huge part of what they thought biblical interpretation was about. Okay, we'll talk about that. Let me go through some more of these questions. So, what did the text mean to the original writers and audiences? What are the differences between them and us? What textual aspects must be considered? That is, are we dealing with the most accurate text available? Some, some ancient texts, you know, are earlier and they're considered the most accurate. So do we have something based on the earliest text? This, for instance, is why the King James Version of the Bible, as beautiful as it is, is not a good version of the Bible to read. Not just because it's hard to understand Middle English, but it's also true that the King James Bible was not based upon the oldest texts that are now available. The King James in the 1600s was written before the Codex Sinaiticus was found, the Codex Alexandrinus, you know, and the, the documents that are now considered the oldest and most reliable of all the documents, none of those were available in the, in the 1600s when King James was written. Yes? Is that also true of the New King James? The New King James has been updated primarily for language, but there are a few places where there was a clear distinction between the... the the documents that were used in the King James Version and what we have today, they made some other adjustments. But it's still true that the King James Version is not a good example of, of using the most recent texts. The book, as you read the book, it talks about that some, and we'll talk a little bit next week about translations. The arguments for the King James being, being uh, King James Version being the textus receptus is the, the term for it, and that, um, that it therefore is God's ordained version, I simply don't think is accurate, and we'll talk about that some later on if you'd like. The King James only idea, I think, is completely without foundation. Okay, it's not the best translation of the Bible. It does not most accurately reflect the oldest documents that we have of what the Scripture was. Um, and I'll talk later about the two schools of Alexandrinus and uh, the uh, Antiochene. Some of the accusations against the King James version is that, like the Codex Alexandrinus, came from Alexandria, and they, they some people dismiss that. Because they say the school in Alexandria, the school of hermeneutics of interpretation, tended to use all this allegorical stuff, you know, and, and it's true, that's true. I'll get into what that means. But dismissing the texts, like the Codex Alexandrinus, which have to do with the original written documents, dismissing those because later on, the people who lived in Alexandria took a particular non-literal approach to interpreting scripture, you're talking about two different things, okay? We'll get into that a little bit next week, all right? And I actually have an article about that I handed out in which class was it that I handed out the article about the King James only stuff? It might have been Bible study. How to study the how to, Bible? I think it was how to study the Bible. Yeah, and when we talked about versions and you know yeah. all that. And again, the book that you, the text um, gets into versions and the different the different. We'll talk a little bit next week about the more formal interpretations versus the you know the um, the less formal the the dynamic equivalence it's called where the goal is to try to capture the meaning that was intended rather than the literal words. And, and Bibles are all along the scope in terms of that. Uh, some of the most popular Bibles that are available today, like the NIV, fall right in the middle. They are more literal than, like, the message is the example of some, you know, of, some, of an effort to make a dynamic equivalent. Everybody loves it. It's, there's very little there that reflects literally what the text said. 
but you get into things like the New American Standard is quite literal. You know, it interprets the words and it keeps them as much literal as, as originally, but then it's hard sometimes to understand the meaning. So I incline toward the, the versions of the Bible that fall in the middle. They are, they, they still try to keep as, as, as accurate to the literal words as possible, but they also understand that literally interpreting the Greeks, Greek words or Hebrew words or Aramaic words may not help you understand what was really meant. And so they sometimes, that's part of the process of interpretation, or I'm sorry, of translation. I'm getting, I'm giving you all the classes today. This, we'll finish this one. <laughs> so then question four, what is or are the primary theological principles in the text? What is the point that this was, for which this was written and then carried through to us today? Fifth, how does the theological principle fit into the rest of Scripture? If somebody draws a theological principle out of Scripture, of a text, and it is clearly contrary to the rest of what Scripture is saying, there's a problem. So you have to then look at the whole context of Scripture. This is where many of the pseudo-Christian religions have come from. They have taken a te one text out of context, have interpreted it, and made a major doctrine over it. Um, an example would be, there is one, one New Testament passage where Paul is talking about many gods. The Mormon church has taken that and determined that that is, Paul wrote this, and that that indicates that there are many different gods out there. There's, many, there's not just one god, there's many kinds of gods. In fact, all people can become gods. Well, in fact, if you read it in the larger context, Paul's whole point in saying that is to say that's not valid. There aren't many gods out there. And yet they take a passage in isolation and interpret it as meaning something that clearly is contrary to all the rest of the New Testament. Okay? Um, and sixth, how should individual Christians today live out these theological principles? Now you'll see, we start with the text, we determine the context for that so we can understand it, we then make sure that we're looking at the best text available, we determine what the meaning is, the theological principles, uh, we compare that to the larger theological picture of the whole, all of Scripture, and then we say, how does that apply to us? That's the methodology of well-founded biblical interpretation. Make sense? Now, in your book, uh, Duval and Hayes have actually done a very interesting thing. With the same kind of uh, approach, they have created what they call the interpretive journey. And in it, they ask these questions. Step one, they say, grasp the text in their town. I mean, they put this in sort of a geographical setting. Their town means the, pe the people who originally wrote it and read it. Uh, in other words, what did the text mean to the original audience? Step two is measure the width of the river to cross. How are they different from us? You know, what is the gap between who they were and where they were and what their context was versus our own? Third, they say, cross the principalizing bridge. In other words, what's the, what's the theological principle that connects the two? Their situation and our situation. That's um, the number four. What are the theological principles? Five, they say consult the biblical map. In other words, how does our theological principle fit with the rest of the Bible? Number six, I have up here. And then grasp the text in our town. How do we apply it to, to our lives? And so they put it in sort of a, you know, a metaphorical geography. Uh, in, in following that through, and then they used that model, that metaphorical model, throughout in, in these pieces. But they're the same pieces. In fact, I'm going to give you another one. This is a, a, a similar. These these are this actually is simplified. I mean, this is very simple kinds of questions. Who wrote the passage, and who was it addressed to? What does the passage say? Literally, obviously, what's on the surface? Are there any words in the passage that need to be examined? What is the immediate context for that passage? When we see immediate context. If you take a phrase out of a, out of a verse of Scripture and don't pay attention to the rest of the verse or the paragraph or the chapter or the book or the Bible, if you don't put it in context, you're often going to get it wrong. All right? that's, that's where heresies come from. Um, what's the broader context in the chapter and the book? What are related verses in the passage subject, and how do they affect the understanding of this passage? That's why every, almost every Bible will have the center column references, which tell you for a given verse that you're reading, here's where else this is referred to in the Bible, so that you can read other versions of it. This is especially the, the case in the Gospels, because the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, often, not always, but often, have descriptions of the same event, but from a different perspective. 
You know, if I'm standing here and Carolyn's sitting there and Guillermo's sitting there and something happens right in the middle of the room, each of us will have a different view of it. We'll see the same thing. Well, that gives us the different perspectives, and having different perspectives gives you a three-dimensional understanding of something. So, um, what are the related verses? What is the historical and cultural background? This is the larger, you know, historical context. What can I conclude from this passage? What does this seem to be saying to me? Do my conclusions agree or disagree with related passages of Scripture and others that have studied the passage? And then, what have I learned and what must I apply to my life? This is exactly the same as the previous screen, but broken down in more steps and a little bit more lay-oriented. And you know, the others are just a little bit form more formal language. Any questions about that? You good so far? Yes. It, uh, it seems like uh, the people that write the study Bibles haven't all read the same book. <coughs> yeah. because we've got several different study Bibles, and very, very often, you'll find the same scripture interpreted totally differently. And these are people that are well-read and studied, and, and you think you can believe, but uh, they all haven't read the same book. Yeah. Well, the good ones are still fairly consistent. There are bad ones out there. And there are some that reflect a particular theological orientation that may not be universal. For instance, uh, the Ryrie Study Bible is dispensationalist. And so, um, if you know dispensationalism, it's the belief that there have been various eras or periods of time from the creation until today, and that God has had a different way of relating to, communicating to, interacting with his people in different periods of time. And those, those different dispensations, as they're called, or eras, God's, God's way of dealing with his people may be completely different. Well, any, any, and dispensationalism is, is fairly large. I think it's mistaken. I don't think it's correct. But you get a study Bible that is dispensationalist in its orientation, like the Ryrie Study Bible, and it, or Schofield Notes. Um, and they will interpret, Ryrie Bible primarily uses Schofield Notes, they will interpret everything in light of a dispensationalist theology, which is not consistent with a covenant theology or a Trinitarian theology. That's not to say that they're not Trin Trinitarians, but there's a different orientation. Um, it's also true that some people, some study Bibles may emphasize one thing more than another. The best ones will say, you know, um, this is what we believe this verse means. Um, other, you know, some authors have proposed this. In the same way that a good Bible, uh, where there are textual variants that are, are, are questioned, you know, like the, the end of the book of Mark, um, the... The King James Bible, the version that, that has the, the, the end of the book of Mark, when they found older documents, that, it, that ending to Mark is not in any of the ancient versions. So the good Bibles, especially the good study Bibles, will italicize all of that, and there will be a footnote that says this, you know, this section of text, these verses, from this to this, do not occur in the oldest extant <coughs> versions of the Bible. And so they'll tell you. Or if there's a variant reading, you know, one ancient ancient text says this and another says that, then it will tell you uh, in a footnote that there is a variance. Now, I, what we have today, the versions of the Bible we have today, various scholars have said are between 96 and 98 percent accurate to the original text, we believe, and that's because of the almost 6,000 different ancient um, Greek, speaking of the New Testament now, of the Greek text that we have, plus all of the writings of the early church fathers where they quote virtually all, you know, 86,000 different quotes of the New Testament alone in the writings of the early church fathers. So we have all of that information, and that has caused us to be able to make good judgments whenever there's a question about, is it this word or that word? You know, does this phrase belong in the oldest versions? And so somewhere between 96 and 98 percent of what we have today, we are confident, is what the original New Testament was written like. And any variants that occur in that other 2 to 4 percent, um, have no theological content. It's like, well, was doctor spelled out or was abbreviated? Because some of the ancient texts, to use a to use an analogy, um, it would be like, is it dr period or is it spelled out doctor? Okay, it's like, do you spell color with a u, like you're English, or do you not? So the variants that still exist that we can't nail down have no um, have no theological significance. 
But if you get variations in study Bibles and things like that, then the question is, do, do one of these reflect a particular theological orientation that may not be widespread? Dispensationalism, while it's fairly common, it's not dominant. It's not large by comparison to other, other approaches. But it will show up in the study Bibles. Okay? Other questions or comments about that? <clears throat> Let's take a break. Also, I just had a question. Um, Pam was just saying, what about, and we'll get into this a little bit later, like next week when we talk about the text, what about the religions that rewrite the Bible? Oh, yeah. um, there is a Joseph Smith version of the Bible. Uh, in fact, I was, from time to time I have to go through our library because people donate books <laughs> and go to find books that really are not consistent with our, our Orthodox or Evangelical Christian belief. Um, and one of them was we had a copy of Joseph Smith's Bible up there. Um, I, I remember I did a one time I was visiting a friend who was house sitting for some friends of friends. He didn't even know these people. And we were both Christians and we decided to, you know, spend time in devotions together. And so um, he one of us had our Bibles, I don't remember which one, and the other one said, Oh, well, here's a Bible, and he pulled it down. Uh, it was called the Darby Bible. And he I uh, I remember he, he pulled it because I read a passage from scripture and he said, Wait a minute, read that again. The version he had, the Darby Bible, is the Unitarian Bible. And so they have removed any reference to the Trinity or any reference to Jesus being the Son of God. And they've just taken them out. And so it read, the reading was completely different. And I experienced that when I, um, in Pasadena, where I went to school and then worked for a while, um, there was a Christian school that I drove by on my way to seminary classes. And uh, they had a beautiful, hand, uh, like carved wooden sign out front and carved in relief. And the sign said, some of you have heard me tell this, I've told this several times, the sign said, For God so loved the world that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Cool. Did you hear it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It left out, he gave his only begotten son. It was a Unitarian Christian school. And so they just took out. So that it read, For God so loved the world that whosoever believed in him. Not that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him. And so there are various religious groups that have simply decided to take out the parts they don't like. Well, that's awfully convenient. <laughs> you know, there's some parts I'd like to take out, but I can't, because it is God's own word to us. We'll talk about that a little bit next week, but that there that's how some people get around the problem of there being things in the Bible that they don't believe are doctrinal, doctrinally accurate, is they just read <clears> them <throat> and then publish their own version. Okay. Um, Let's look at a passage of scripture, and I, I just I have this as an example of well, partly as why do we need a biblical interpretation uh, process or methodology? This is from Luke 17. This same passage, uh, verse almost exactly the same, is in Matthew. <coughs> this is after Jesus has left the temple, and he tells them that the temple, you know, um, that will be destroyed, and it's, it's an eschatological or an end times um, declaration by Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking, uh, eating, drinking, marrying, and give, being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. In the same way, in the days of Lot, people were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building, but the day Lot left Sodom, Fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is in the housetop, on the housetop, with possessions inside, that means Mirador, um, should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life, um, their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord? They asked. He replied, Where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> now, um, what does it mean in the days of Noah? You have to know something about the story of Noah. And if you don't know that, and see, for a lot of us that know Scripture, we read this stuff and... And we know enough that it you know, resonates. We understand what it means. But the reason why we still have to do the work is because we may not remember it accurately. Or there may be aspects of it that we don't understand and don't, don't even know it. What does it mean, the days of the Son of Man? You know, what is that? What is Son of Man and what are the days of the Son of Man? Um, 
What does it mean in the days of Lot? Who was Lot? What was going on in his day? Um, what does it mean? You know, what was the day that Lot left Sodom? It says fire and sulfur. What's that all about? Now, you may know those stories, and great for you if you do. But people, if you're preparing teaching or, you know, or you're communicating with people who aren't believers, and they read something like this, they're not going to have a clue. Um, again, what does it mean? On the day the Son of Man is revealed. What, you know, remember Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? What's the importance of that? Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. Does that really mean you're not supposed to save your own life if, if you know, if everything blows up around you? Is that what that means? Um, two people in one bed, one would be taken the other left, one would be taken the other left. Where, Lord? <laughs> Where are they taken? Where there's a dead body, there the vultures will gather. <laughs> Every one of those things I've circled and more in this one passage, we need a process for understanding and what that means and then communicating what that means. Even if you're not a teacher or preacher, communicating with somebody who might read this and say, you're a Christian. What does this mean? Um, almost everybody, for instance, believes that verse 34 and 35 um, are about the rapture, right? Right. One person's left behind, and, and one person gets raptured. The good person leaves. You know, uh, I wish they'd all been ready. Remember the Larry Norman song? We're back in the early days of, you know, I wish they'd all been ready. Um, one of the very first contemporary Christian musicians, Larry Norman, and that was one of his songs uh, about the rapture. Evangelical biblical scholars, when you compare this to the book of Matthew, up in, when it talks about the days of Noah, and it, instead of saying, then the flood came and destroyed them all, it says... Then the flood came and they were taken away. The bad guys were taken away. <clears throat> Jesus' reference here, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will, will gather, seem to be saying they will go to the place of the dead. These passages, if you really study them, seem to be saying that the one who's taken away are the bad guys. The good ones get left. That's not consistent with most people's idea of what the rapture is. Go back and look at that again, and look at the Matthew parallel to this. Do you understand why? I'm not saying, and, and that doesn't shake anybody, it shouldn't shake anybody's faith, there's nothing earth-shattering about that, but it's an example that it may very well be that not the best biblical interpretation policy, or program, or, or uh, approach has been used, and almost all of us have come to believe things that may not be actually what Scripture is saying. And so, we need to do the work. I've read two articles in the last year and a half or so, both of which said we read this backwards. The people taken away are the bad, are the ones who are being punished, who are being sent to the place of the dead. Where the vulture, you know, where the dead are, the vultures will gather. Where are they being taken to? The apostles asked. To the place of the dead. That's what Jesus' reference is. Now, the point is, all of the pieces of this, that I've got boxed in red and pretty much everything else, we need to understand, we need to have a methodology, an approach that will help us interpret the meaning of passages like this. Fair? Yes. Just the same with Lot. You know, he's left behind, <laughs> everybody else is gone. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You know, they, and, and, you know, no one in his family were left behind, everybody else was gone. Yeah. So, uh, yes? Uh, what I was going to say, aren't there many uh, uh, churches out there that don't even go to the Old, uh, Old Testament? Well, and that's a problem. Uh, there was a church here in town, and I was told the minister didn't preach in the Old Testament because he thought we were only a New Testament church. That's wrong. The New Testament. <laughs> exactly. The New Testament is very clear. Jesus quoted the Old Testament over and over and over again. If he quoted it all the time and made references to it like this, then who are we to say that the Old Testament is no longer valid for us? Now, it is the Old Covenant, the Old Agreement that God had with his people. That's, that's what the word testament means. It means covenant. We have a new covenant, which completes, you know, fulfills, makes unnecessary because it's fulfilled in parts of the old of the old covenant. But that doesn't mean that, that it, it's not foundation. You know, we are saved in Christ because we are adopted into the people of God. Paul said we are grafted onto the mind of the Jewish people. So the reason the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, is part of our Bible is because it is still God's word for us. Some of it has been fulfilled and is no, longer, um, is, is no longer necessary for us to follow, but it is still God's word. 
That's why I don't like, you know, the New Testaments and Psalms. It's nice to be able to have something to hand out if you're handing out stuff in the street. But leaving out the Old Testament is a, is a serious mistake because we've left out two-thirds of the God's Word to us. Okay? All right. Uh, but you, you see from this one example why a methodology for how we're to understand and interpret Scripture is very, very important for us. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, and I could go through and we could talk about each one of those things. I don't think I need to at this point. We'll, we'll get into some details later. But I wanted to give you an example. <coughs> Here are some rules for biblical interpretation. Um, there is the rule of definition. First, we have to know what the words mean. We have to know what the English word means, and we have to know um, what the original words it came from if there's a question. That doesn't mean you look up the Greek and, or Hebrew or Aramaic of every word. Uh, there's not a lot of Aramaic in the Bible. Part of the book of Daniel is written in Aramaic because Aramaic was the Babylonian language. Chaldean, Aramaic, basically the same thing. Um, and some of, the, some of the other passages like Talitha Kome, you know, some of the past, uh, expressions in the New Testament where people are being quoted as Aramaic because that was the common language then too. It was the common language because the Jewish people in the, in the, the Jude, from Judah had been taken off into captivity for a couple of generations into Babylonia. So when they came back, all the kids spoke Aramaic. And that's why Jesus and the apostles spoke Aramaic. It was the Babylonian language. Well, you don't have to, you don't have to read Greek. You don't have to read Hebrew. Um, you don't have to read Aramaic in order to be able to get the meaning of the words. Now, there are times, and a good study Bible will help you with this, there are times when what word was, being, was chosen by the translators does make a difference. For instance, you could read the word another in English. Well, in Greek, there are two words that get translated another. One means, one is alos, the other is heteros. Alos means another of the same kind. All right? So, another. You know, there's this one, and then there's another. We just like it. The word heteros means another that is different. There is this one, but then there's another one that's not the same. Those two words, both of which get translated another, can mean the opposite in terms of the comparison of two things. Now, again, a good Bible, a good translation of the Bible, will make that clear. And that's why dynamic equivalence can be more valuable. See, a literal translation, see, in English, we don't have, we don't have one word that will differentiate between another of the same kind and another of a different kind. And so, because another is the way we translate the word alos and the word heteros, a literal translation will have no choice but to translate it the only way we can translate that word with another. And could be confusing. A dynamic equivalent translation will come up with a way, that it may actually say another of the same kind or another of a different kind. Well, a literalist will say, those other words are not in there, it's only one word. Do you leave it out and have something that could be completely confusing? Or do you include enough English words to make clear what the meaning is? You see the challenge there? Um, I believe in translating, you know, accurate translation of scripture, but accurate, the word accurate, may not mean literally translating word for word. And English, like so many languages, um, does not have the same word order as ancient Greek or Hebrew. If you literally translate Greek words or Hebrew words, word, first word, second word, third word, fourth word, you will not understand what's being said. Because they don't, you know, we have a very clear, what we think is a very clear order. You know, you've got, you've got adjectives, nouns, adverbs, verbs, you know, um, etc. Other languages mix that all up. You all, you all have experienced the fact that, in, that Spanish, for instance, the qualifier for a word is always at the end. It's after the word, not before it. And we have to get used to that, you know. Um, right? You understand that, that that's the, the adjective uh, or even adverb comes after the word in Spanish. English is not like that. Well, if you think that's confusing sometimes as to what order you ought to put the words in, Greek and Hebrew are way off the map in terms of that. You literally translate each word in the order they're there and you will not know what it means. So how far does the translator go in making that clear? The question is, we need to know what the words mean. And so that requires a, an effort in translation. If you have good study Bible, this is also the reason why you need more than one good version of the Bible. 
I've got a half a dozen. I mean, I, I, the New International is what I use. I, before that, I used New American Standard, which is one of the most literal in, in translations. And so I still will go back to that. I will use the message, even though it is the most dynamic. Some people say it's pretty much a paraphrase, although it is a translation that Eugene Peterson did from the original languages. But uh, it gives you a diff completely different kind of perspective on those things. I, we don't use that, I don't use that in church. I know churches that use the message as their pew Bible. I don't agree with that. I think it's, Eugene Peterson has done a great service, but it's a little too loose for that being your only Bible. Um, and so I will have, I'll look up, you know, the, the Holman Standard uh, Bible is a really good, fairly modern translation, the English Standard Version. Um, that gives you, you need, if you're really doing the, the job of studying the Word, and you're looking at biblical interpretation as a process, you need to have different snapshots, because different translators will translate those words differently, and you get a more complete understanding. Now, there are some versions, as we said, don't use the Darby Bible, don't use the New Century, you know, which again is a, is a completely off-the-wall uh, kind of approach. Um, don't use Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible. But there are a number of good, solid, evangelical, scholarly, and you know, godly translations that are available. Okay? We need to know the definition. Secondly, we need to understand uh, the usage, the rule of usage. There are words and idioms that exist in the, the writing in Scripture that we need to know what those mean, how they were used in those times. The Jewish writers in the first century Greco-Roman milieu, they had certain understandings and expressions and things like that that we don't we don't get unless you do a little bit of work at it. Now again, a good study Bible will explain that to you. Um, but we need to understand how the words are used. We need to understand the context. That means the context in light of um, the other passages. And the, I mentioned this earlier, 1 Corinthians 8.5, the second half of 1 Corinthians 8.5 says, Paul writes, for there be God's many and Lord's many. And the Mormon church has taken that to interpret there's more than one God. But that's a proof text. They've taken a, a, a fragment of 1 Corinthians 8.5. If you read all of 1 Corinthians 8, you'll understand the context is that Paul is, is, is disagreeing with, is teaching exactly contrary to the Mormon interpretation of that passage. And you won't know that unless you understand the passage within the book. Every, in, in the Bible, every phrase is part of a verse, every verse is part of a paragraph, every paragraph is part of a book, and that book is part of the whole of Scripture. And there is a unity in all of Scripture. Even though the Bible as we have it is 66 books written by over 40 authors on three continents in three languages over a 1,500 year period, there is still an astonishing unity in this book which means we interpret everything in light of the unity of all of Scripture. That's the large context. Yes? You know how in Spanish uh, certain words can have a multitude of meanings, but it has to be uh, heard in context in right. order to make exactly. sense at that time? Is that the same with Aramaic? Um, well, Aramaic doesn't... Is minor, is minor. The Aramaic is not a good example. Greek or Hebrew. Okay. You know, with, with the, yeah, there are there are idioms. I mean, there are expressions that you have to you have to know something. That's when we talk about the usage, how those words are used. Um, an example in English, so that you get it. And the same thing happens in the biblical languages. Uh, perhaps not as much. English is the worst for for idioms. You know, for those of you who are you know Guillermo is the only one I see here who English is your second language. You know, there's. Guillermo and I have breakfast once a week, and I'm always using an idiom, and I'll go, you know what that means? And he'll go, no. And I'll have to explain it to him, you know. Um, and then sometimes just the way we use words. An example would be a new cadet in a military school go, boy, he's really green. Or, isn't that tree a lovely color of green? Isn't it a lovely green? Now, do this, that's the same word. Does it mean the same thing? Do we mean that that cadet in the military academy who just arrived is you know, is a combination blue and yellow, you know? No, we don't. And we do that all the time. Again, unless you, unless you are self-aware, really self-aware, we don't realize how often we use idioms. Things that don't mean, the meaning is not at all what the literal words mean, but rather it's something that's been accepted by common usage. Right, Guillermo? I mean, we're always doing that. From time to time, there will be a Mexican idiom that he'll have to explain to me, and I don't get it either. Uh, but you really run into that when you start dealing with translation issues. Okay? 
<coughs> and a lot of it is you have to have the context, uh, because the context will help you understand what are we talking about here. Uh, there is the rule of historical background. Again, um, spiritual principles may be timeless, but they may be expressed differently for different historical situations. The things that first century Jews, since the, the early writing of, of the scripture, with the, Paul's writing being the exception, because Paul was writing to some Gentile churches, Corinth and Thessalonica and others, but um, most of the writing of the New Testament, Luke is the only non-Jewish writer of any part of the Bible. Okay? Luke was a Gentile. Every other book is written by a Jew who has the Jewish context, the Jewish historical references, the Jewish you know, point of view. Most of the books of the New Testament were written still to Jews because the early Christians were all Jews. And so we need to know something about what their historical background is. Uh, history plays a huge part in us understanding the Bible because it plays a huge part in understanding where the writer was coming from as a human as well as where the people he's writing, he's writing to come from. Okay? There is the rule of logic. We have to use logical reasoning. You know, it has to make sense. God is the God of reason. He wants us to use our common sense. He wants to use our logical reasoning. And people come up with these crazy kind of interpretations sometimes. Um, I'm going to talk about allegory in a few minutes. Um, there's been periods of time in the church when allegory was the standard way of biblical interpretation. Allegory is where you assign a particular kind of spiritual meaning to every small detail. <laughs> to the point of getting really nuts. You know, really crazy. I'll give you an example in a minute. We have to use logic. It has to make sense. We need to use the rule of inference. And inference is a fact that is justifiably or reasonably implied from other facts or evidence. I'll give you the perfect example. The doctrine of the Trinity. The Trinity, the word Trinity, is not used anywhere in the Bible. The doctrine of the Trinity is an inference from the other content we find in the Bible. When Jesus said, you know, go and make disciples of all the world and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It sure sounds like he's talking about a trinity. And the fact that we're told in various places, you know, that he is the Son of God and that the Holy Spirit was there. The Spirit is hovering over the waters. Genesis 1 uh, talks about the Spirit. And all through the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Well, you take all of that together... And it is a very reasonable inference to see that God exists in three persons, even though the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. So there is the rule of reasonable inference. And again, it has to be logical, referring back to number five. But there is a legitimate kind of inference. There is the rule of genre judgment. The Bible, as I said, 66 books made up of many, many different kinds of genres. A genre is a, a style of literature. There are prophetic books, there are historical books, there are books of poetry, there are letters. Uh, you cannot use the same goggles, you know, the same uh, mental perspective to interpret Genesis that you do Joshua, that you do Psalms, that you do Ecclesiastes, that you do you know, the Gospel of Matthew, that you do the First Timothy, that you do Revelation. If you try to interpret all those with exactly the same criteria and expectations and attitude and approach, you're going to get confused because they're very different in terms of their style and that style affects how we need to understand them. And that's why the book, he not only goes into how you, uh, how you interpret Old, New Testament and Old Testament, but he talks about how you interpret the Gospels, how you interpret Acts, how you interpret the letters of Paul, etc. And that's why we break those up into categories because we need to understand that there are different approaches that those writers took in creating those documents by God's inspiration. Um, there is the rule of dependence upon the Holy Spirit. This is not just a human book. And while I'm focusing a lot on the human intent and the human context, historical, cultural, etc., because God hews people in particular situations and contexts to write this, it is still a divine book in our belief. It is the very Word of God. And so to rightly understand it and interpret it, we always must rely upon the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who inspired the writing of this book is the one to help us interpret it. You know, he guided the writing of it, he should guide the understanding of it. It's as simple as that. Okay? He will illuminate scripture for us if we'll allow him to. Any question about that? We'll, we'll deal with some of these later on. Again, I'm giving you kind of a, the high points for some things we'll talk about in more detail later. Yes? Just, just curious. Um, I was raised where it was always the Holy Ghost. So, is that... Is that uh, uh, something 
in the Bible it's always referred to as the Holy Spirit? No, um, the reason that in common usage that changed is because people started thinking of ghosts as these disembodied spirit, you know, Oh, spirits, okay. ectoplasm that floats around and scares people and influences people and everything else, and that began to take on a negative connotation for people. The idea of a spirit and a ghost is the same meaning. It can be translated either way, but the more modern approach is spirit because it doesn't have all that negative, you know, occultic kind of baggage. It's as simple as that. It, it means the same thing. Um, yes, Doug, did you have your hand up? Doug? Okay. You wait, and I'll call on you. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, again, I'm hitting some of the high points of things as an introduction today. We'll get into more detail on some of this later, but this is sort of so you can see where we're going. I want to spend a few minutes now talking about the history of biblical interpretation and hermeneutics. Um, the first age in the history of the church is called the apostolic <clears throat> age, from Jesus to about 100 AD. This basically means when the apostles were still alive. The apostles being those who were taught and mentored and guided once whom Jesus um, commissioned to take responsibility for the creation of the church after his death. They were the authorities during the first hundred years. And the reason that we say hundred years is that John, the longest lived of all the apostles, lived until somewhere in the last decade, 90 to 100. We, get, we don't have an exact date, but everybody pretty much agrees it was somewhere between AD 90 and AD 100. That's when John, the evangelist and apostle, uh, died. And I believe that John wrote the same person. The John, who was the beloved uh, disciple, is the one who wrote the Gospel of John, the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. And people try to dissect that, and I don't think there's any valid reason to believe that the, the ancient writings of the church fathers that they acknowledged him as being the author of those three, there's no, no legitimate reason to question that. Um, and that sort of, I'll, I'll comment on that, that too many times, scholars, teachers, um, they they got to find something to do since they're getting paid to do a job. And, uh, it's, it really is as simple as that. You know, part of the things that people in scholarly pursuits have to do, and I'm not making this up, I'm not being, I'm not being flip about this. Um, you've heard the expression, publish or perish. If somebody is a paid academic, they are expected to publish. Well, they get something published, you can't just write the traditional stuff that everybody's been saying for hundreds of years. You've got to come up with something new and different, or, or it's not going to get published. That's, that, that's I'm, again, I'm not being flipped. That's a fact. And so I think that's one of the things, one of the primary things, as well as maybe the devil's involved in some of this, um, that, that people are motivated to come up with a different explanation, a different idea. And so somebody came along and said, well, what if John the Evangelist, the beloved uh, uh, disciple, wasn't the one who wrote the letters of John, or didn't write the Revelation. And from that sort of, well, that would be different if that were the case, they built arguments in favor of that, that I don't think hold, hold up. And yet that's where those kind of ideas come from. And then, then he teaches his, one of his classes that, and three of the people in that class become professors, and they teach their students that, and before you know it, that becomes a dominant idea. Um, and we always have to be willing to step back and go, wait a minute, what is that based on? So. Apostles yes. have been taught by Christ, is that right? No, disciples have been taught by Christ. Apostles have been sent by Christ. The difference in a disciple and an apostle, the disciples were all followers and students of Jesus. The apostles were the twelve, and plus some, there's more than just twelve, that Jesus um, ordained, anointed, appointed to then go out with the message. There were the original twelve, uh, obviously Judas Iscariot, you know, um, was taken out of that number. They then elected Matthias, who was just reading this morning in, in Acts um, in chapter 1, where Matthias was selected by casting of lots to replace Judas. Once they picked two candidates who had been with Jesus from the start, the goal, the, uh, the requirements were that they have been with Jesus the whole time. And, have, and, have, and have, uh, from the start of his teaching, from the baptism is what the, what the scripture says, and that they had witnessed the risen Christ so that they could give first person testimony to the resurrection. So, um, Matthias was appointed, but then there, and Paul was given an especial anointment, and he had to defend that over and over and over again, how Christ appeared to him miraculously and taught him, he talked about, you know, one who was elevated into the heavens and was, you know, was instructed. But then there are places where um, James, the brother of Jesus, who was the head of the Jerusalem Council, where he's identified in one place as an apostle. So there are others who were given that. 
The apostle means one who is sent out. So they were the ones who were the missionaries responsible for carrying on the faith. Okay? Um, so the apostolic age was when they were still alive, the last one being John, who died in the last decade of the first century. We then have a period of what's called the apostolic father, sometimes called the sub-apostolic age. It's the immediate post-apostolic. The reason they're called the apostolic fathers is the people in this period were, um, all of them were known to and by. They were the friends and uh, students of the apostles. And so you get these people like Polycarp, who was a student of John the Apostle, who they're carrying on the witness that they received firsthand from those who had been apostles. So this is the apostolic fathers immediately after the apostles themselves. Um, and some of, you know, you'll run into names, um, names like Irenaeus, I mean, mentioned Polycarp, Justin Martyr. Um, these are the people who came, who carried on the faith from the apostles. Now, um, the, the belief of the early church was that uh, the truth, the, the theological, the religious truth that Jesus had, had given, was given to the apostles, and so they were, after Jesus' death, the ultimate source for what is, what is true, what is correct. And then that was carried on from those apostles to the apostolic fathers, the people who knew them. Um, you're familiar with the doctrine of, of apostolic succession, which exists in the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, some other churches. Apostolic succession meant that a person who was to become a minister, a, a, a minister, a priest, a bishop of the gospel, they had to have hands laid on and be ordained by someone who had been ordained by someone who had been ordained by somebody who was ordained by an apostle. And the Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church and some others, Anglican Church, Anglican Union, say today that their ministers are, there's a, a complete line of ordination all the way back to the apostles. Well, early on, in the, during the time of the Apostolic Fathers, especially as various heresies started coming into the church, Marcion, the first great heretic of the church, uh, the, the church was challenged by how can we make sure that the ministers are teaching and preaching the right gospel, that they're not heretics, that they're keeping it. And, and, and they said at that time, well, the best way is to know that those people are actually taught and trained and ordained by the apostles who were taught and trained and ordained and anointed by Jesus. And so the idea is the best way for the church to try to make sure that what is being taught and preached was the true and correct gospel was to have there be a direct connection back to the time when they knew that it was right. Jesus and then the apostles, the apostolic fathers, etc. Some churches still say today that you're not truly ordained unless you are ordained by apostolic succession. That is, you know, it's been a passing on from the apostles. The only problem is some of the people who are ordained as part of apostolic succession are the worst heretics imaginable. So clearly, 2,000 years later, that doesn't hold anymore. It's much more, and you know, Presbyterian Church does not maintain apostolic succession as a requirement because we say, what, you know, do you agree with the tenets of the creeds, the great creeds of the church, especially the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed? If you agree with all those things, then, you're, then your theology is right. You know, if you, I don't care who ordained you or what line they go back to, if you disagree with the basic faith, principles of faith, then, you know, you're not theologically accurate. So, I, I actually had somebody in town here, Carol and I had dinner with them one time, and when they asked about my ordination, and I, I described it to them, and they said, well, so you're not ordained by apostolic succession? And I said, no. And they said, then how can you offer the sacraments? And I said, because we don't hold to that anymore. And they were like... You can't do that. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Say it isn't so. They say it isn't so. And yet, again, people who are ordained in that, in that line of succession are some of the worst heretics going. I mean, you know, the Bishop Spong and, and people like that, who are just really out to lunch, are all products of apostolic succession. So that doesn't hold it. I, uh, yes. There's a, a game you play where there's 12 people in a circle, and you start telling a story, and when you get telephone. Around, yeah, it's called telephone. The story's completely changed. Yeah. So, again, to me, do we affirm the ancient declarations of the faith, not who was it that laid hands on us? That's, that's the point. So you have the apostolic fathers. You then have what's called, uh, and, and some of these overlap. Okay. You have the anti-Nicene anti period. Anti means before. So this is from the period around 200 to 325 AD, which was the date of the Council of Nicaea, the first great council of the church. Um, 
And the Council of Nicaea was the first of seven um, ecumenical councils, and that was the place at which the Nicene Creed was, was written, etc. Now, during this period, uh, from actually the second century into the third century, two great hermeneutical schools, schools of interpretation grew up. One of them was in Alexandria, and one in Antioch. You will hear about the Alexand uh, Alexandrian and Anti uh, Antiochian schools. They had very different approaches to understanding how to, to interpret Scripture. Um, the, the school of Antioch took a very literal sense of Scripture. They believed that, you know, we need to take the most literal understanding of what the Bible says possible. The Alexandrian school focused on allegory, interpreting Scripture as allegory. And uh, the allegory means that you find hidden meaning, that there is hidden meaning, almost secret meaning, behind anything that's in the Bible. Now, <coughs> I'll give you an example of that, not from, from Scripture, but from a, from a pseudepigraphal book, a, a Gnostic writing. The Epistle of Barnabas, not part of our Bible, but this is such an obvious example of allegory that I use it anyway. The Episcopal, uh, the Epistle of Barnabas, a Gnostic writing, some of these scholars who wanted to accept that as part of the Bible, it never was accepted. There's a passage in the Epistle of Barnabas where Abraham, after God tells him to circumcise, to be circumcised, to circumcise his, his family and tribe, that Abraham circumcised 318 members of his household, male members of his household, obviously. Um, well, the allegorical interpretation of that was that the Greek letters, which were used to abbreviate 314, were um, our version of IHT, you know, um, Yoda, um, I can't even remember the Greek letters right off the top of my head. But anyway, the abbreviation for the number 318 in Greek was IHT. Well, the allegorical interpretation was that that was a spiritual sign, I-H, uh, is, are the first two letters in the name of Jesus, and Tau, T, was seen as the symbol of the cross. And so here's this great spiritual meaning that they get from the number 318 because of the Greek letters that are abbreviated, which they then say are the abbreviations, a prophetic abbreviation for the name of Jesus and the cross on which he died. And you're going, uh, really? That's what allegorical interpretation is all about finding the secret symbolic meaning behind obvious stuff. Now, if you've ever read Pilgrim's Progress, Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory where every event that happens in the main character's life has a spiritual meaning behind it. So it is, it is, a, it is a form of literature, an allegory. Now, that's not trying to interpret the Bible as an allegory. It's simply to try to teach life lessons, Christian life lessons, in an allegorical way. That's different than when they actually try to make everything have a secret meaning. You know, they would read a passage of Scripture, and then there'd be all this secret, mystical, allegorical understanding that, you know, that somebody needed to come up with. The Alexandrian school specialized in that, whereas the Antiochene school stuck with more of the literal stuff. This is one of the arguments of the people who advocate for King James-only Bible, because they say that some, like the Codex Alexandrinus, one of, the, one of the oldest of the texts that we have, came from Alexandria, and the Alexandrian school of hermeneutics did all this allegorical stuff that they didn't focus on the literal interpretation, etc. But you know what? Whether they did allegorical interpretation of Alexandria has nothing to do, nothing to do, with is the text, that you know, the actual written words that are in the original uh, Codex Alexandrinus, which is one of the oldest that we have, that and Codex Sinaiticus, uh, and is the Codex uh, Vaticanus is a third very old one. Um, and so the King James only folks dismiss the, any other translation of the Bible because they say it's based upon a text that came partly from Alexandria and that Alexandrian uh, interpreters affected those interpretations. No, that's simply not accurate. Uh, but it is true that the Antiochene school would probably be more consistent with the approach we take, which is the first thing you think is what's the most literal understanding of this, okay? Then we have the age of the ecumenical council, starting with the first Nicene council in 325, going up to the last of the Nicene council, the seventh of the ecumenical councils in 787, the first and the last of the ecumenical councils, meaning that you know, this is before there's, there's any division or split between various parts of Christianity. 
the first seven of those councils um, started, the first one started in Nicaea and the last one was in Nicaea. In between they had two councils in Constantinople and various other places. Um, and those councils, bless you, uh, many times, bless you. The, um, most of the seven ecumenical councils were oriented towards developing a Christology, that is a theology of Jesus, you know, of the Christ Jesus. Who was he? The first Nicene Council, for instance, was in opposition to the heretic Arius, who claimed that Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Son of God, was created by the Father. As Arius said, there was a time when Jesus was not, that he was made by the Father. And the, the church decided in the Council of Nicaea that Jesus was co-eternal with the Father. And so a lot of this had to do with biblical interpretation. What does the Bible say? How do we understand <clears throat> what Jesus said about himself and others said about him? We then get into the medieval period, which is the 5th to the 15th century. And here we come into a more formalizing of four different exegetical or hermeneutical modes. You could interpret scripture in a literal sense, that's first, and that's more consistent with what the school in Antioch wanted to do. Or second, you could do it in an allegorical sense, finding the hidden symbolic meanings in it, that more like what the Alexandrian school did. Third, you could focus on interpreting according to the moral application. You know, what is the moral lesson? You know, and you interpret everything in terms of this being a moral lesson for the readers and hearers. Or fourth, a secret or mystical sense, especially with regard to uh, eschatology. In other words, trying to read every passage of Scripture, the New Testament at least, in terms of what does that tell us about what's coming, of uh, the end times. Um, those were four different approaches. To a, to a great extent, that you could boil that down to being two. There was the literal sense, what does the scripture actually say? And then the other three, allegorical, moral application, and secret or mystical sense, all of them were some version of allegorical, where you're trying to find some hidden, often hidden meaning in it. Obviously, there are some scriptures that have clear moral implications, but all three of these latter had some sort of allegorical, trying to find a hidden meaning in it. Um, we then get to the modern period, which is the 15th century on, onward, the 1400s. During this period, um, two great things happened. First, there was a return to the texts themselves, going back to scripture. For instance, in the 16th uh, century, which is the time of the, uh, the Reformation, there was a real emphasis in the Reformation in returning to the original text of scripture. One of the great cries or declarations of the Reformation was so, uh, sola scriptura, which means scripture alone as the source of authority. You know, sola gratia, grace alone, etc. There were others. But sola scriptura, one of the great cries of the Reformation was only scripture as the source of our authority. And so because of that, there was an explosion in scriptural studies, in you know, translating, in reading the texts uh, as close to the original as possible, etc. There was another uh, popular comment in the Reformation, um, ad fontes. Ad fontes means back to the sources. And so there was an emphasis at that time in going back, not just taking the Latin uh, Vulgate, which was the, the book the Catholic Church used, the translation the Catholic Church used, but going back to the Greek and back to the Hebrew, especially, in order to be able to understand what the Bible really says. And then to take the original Greek and the Hebrew and translate it into languages that that the common people could read, because the Catholic Church had forbidden common people to read the Bible, even in Latin, assuming they could read Latin, because they thought, you'll get it wrong, you'll misinterpret it, you'll, you can't apply it correctly, and so you need a priest to read it and then interpret it for you. Well, the Reformers completely disagreed with that. In fact, Martin Luther spent a year and locked up in a castle in hiding from the uh, Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope who were out to get him and in that one year that he was in hiding he translated from the Greek and the Hebrew he translated the Bible into common German in doing so he did two things one he provided the Bible in a language people could read again assuming they could read it all they were more likely to read German than anything else and secondly he created modern German in his translations uh, previously they had the same version as sort of like Middle English, they had a Middle German, uh, and it was much, much more difficult. He, he, Martin Luther invented modern, the modern German language in writing and translating the Bible. And so there was this huge emphasis during that time on getting back to the original sources of 
translating it accurately into language people can understand, and really um, making the text the focus, not somebody's interpretation of it. Unfortunately, at the same time, starting especially in the 18th, by the 18th century, we get modern scholars like Friedrich Schleiermacher. <laughs> Friedrich Schleiermacher. <laughs> Friedrich Schleiermacher is considered the father of modern theology, which means he is, he is the one who sort of, of all the Germans, Bob's left already, so I can't tease him about Germans, uh, of all the liberal Germans, Schleiermacher is the one who is the father of modern liberal theology, the one that started them in the wrong direction. And, and he made everything sort of, how do you feel about it? How does it make you feel? You know? And he, he subjectivized scripture. Um, he also was responsible for really creating a new direction in terms of hermeneutics because he believed that every problem in interpretation was a problem in understanding, and the problem in understanding was not with the text, it was with us. And so, um, You'll hear names, and later on, I may or may not, if I can steal myself to it. I've read Schleiermacher's work as part of my theology ring, and he's the kind of guy you just go, oh, you know. He meant so well, and he messed up so bad, and he's caused so much pain and grief in the world. Um, you get to others like Wilhelm Dilthe, who was uh, a follower of Schleiermacher's, of um, Martin Heidegger, who came still later. Now we're into the, into the 20th century, late 19th, 20th century. Um, Hans George Gadamer, you'll read names like that if you, you may get into them in the book, uh, later on in the book. These people all began to take interpretation into a liberal direction. They're the ones that began to make uh, hermeneutics mean something other than, uh, they, they infected the hermeneutic or biblical interpretation process with subjectivism, with uh, all sorts of other things that really made it all about us and, and, and completely um, starting with Schleiermacher, began to remove any sense of the supernatural. They took the Holy Spirit, they took the direction of God out of it, and made it an entirely human document. This is treating scripture like secular classical literature. They began to say this is just one kind of writing, just like Homer, or Sophocles, or Aristophanes, or you know, any of the ancient uh, writings, uh, the, you know, the, the war histories of Julius Caesar or anything else, and they advocated that you read this in the same way you would read those. It's just a different genre of literature. So they took the supernatural completely out of it. And you get into the 20th century people like Rudolf Bultmann. Bultmann was the one who talked about demythologizing scripture, which means he says, we put this in the historical context, and history and the supernatural are um, not consistent with each other, and so therefore there can be no supernatural. So take all the myth out of it. Um, these, this is the one direction hermeneutics went, but from the Reformation on, there has continued to be a very strong you know, stream alongside that, especially of, of evangelical and orthodox scholars who do go ad fontes, go back to the original sources, who sola scriptura, who believe that the scripture is their only true source for authority. Not what someone says, not even what someone says about scripture, but scripture itself is the word of God. And so you see these two massive rivers and at various times, one or the other often would be at a higher level, either the liberal, anti-supernatural version of hermeneutics and interpretation, or you know, the, the evangelical focused on the true script, um, and, and they vary. Right now, I believe that we are on a, a huge upsurge for the evangelical side, you know, for a, a, a process of interpretation and hermeneutics that is much more oriented toward the Bible as the Word of God, uh, but still with good scholarship. Right? He said um, that Luther wrote the Bible or translated the Bible into German. Mm -hmm. Is that oh, how, that seems like so, such a Herculean task? Did he use German? <laughs> did he use? Uh, he must have. But what do they say about that Bible? <clears throat> What's the? It's brilliant. It's one of the great works of, of uh, translation interpretation ever. Uh, again, and when you talk about translation. He didn't just translate the Greek and Hebrew into the German of his day. He did a dynamic equivalent in terms of putting it in words that he knew people, not the formal German. I mean, have any of you all ever studied German? Okay, if you study German in classrooms, you'll learn Hochdeutsch, which means high German. It is a very formal language. If you go out on the streets in Germany, especially if you go to Bavaria, for instance, which has their own sort of dialect, and you speak the, the, the German that you learned in classrooms, Hochdeutsch, 
right, German? They'll laugh at you. What is wrong with you? It'd be like walking up to somebody and saying, you know, hast thou changed for a quarter? You know? <laughs> um, and Luther, instead of doing the formal middle, middle German that existed in his day, he translated into what was clearly the direction common people talked. And in doing so, as I say, he created modern German in addition to doing a very readable, very accurate translation of the Hebrew and Greek Bible. So, what is that Bible called today? Um, Luther's Bible? I'm not sure. Um, it may be the Heidelberg Bible, um, because the Heidelberg Confession came out of that. But I'm not, I'm not sure what the title of it is in German. Interesting question. I mean, Luther's translation is something to refer to. But any last questions or anything? I think that's plenty enough for today to give you kind of a sense. And as I say, I've hit a bunch of the high points because we'll then be unwrapping a lot of that as we go along.